Would you open your Bibles, please, to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. And we'll just take a few minutes tonight and think about the second part of the message that we started last week, entitled, Ten Commandments for End Times, or as we change that, Ten Commandments for Any Time. <laughs> Amen? Because the truth of the matter is that the old-time religion is the every-time religion, the all-time religion, and it's the now-time religion. And so we want to look into God's Word together tonight and just see where we can apply these things to our lives and how we can be ready for the events that may be just ahead for us. And so would you stand, please, as we open God's Word together? 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 12. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal among you which comes upon you for your testing as though some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing so that also at the revelation of His glory you may rejoice with exaltation. If you are reviled for the name of Christ... You are blessed, because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. By no means let any of you suffer as a murderer, or thief, or evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not feel ashamed, but in that name let him glorify God. For it is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Therefore, let those also who suffer according to the will of God entrust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. I don't think we need to go back and review all the reasons that we gave last week for believing that we are the generation most likely to be the generation that will see the return of Christ. And since we have established that, and I think we're in general agreement about that, let's just move on now to the second of the uh, Ten Commandments or the last five of the Ten Commandments that we started on last week. And let me just give you these in sort of a summary way. And you can uh, take these down and I hope they'll be helpful to you. First of all, he says that we are not to be surprised by the fiery ordeal among ourselves. This is in the language in which this was written. It could be interpreted and probably really better would be interpreted. Stop thinking that it's something strange that you're going through. So you see, it isn't just a modern day or modern church phenomena when uh, church members today, when Christians today, seem to be surprised by the fact that they're going through an ordeal. That seems to be traditional. It goes all the way back to New Testament times. And so he had to say to them, stop thinking it's something unusual for you to be going through such a thing as this. And let me, let me remind you that Primarily what's in view here is not, it's not just the things that we go through in life, such as injury, sickness, disappointments. It's not that kind of thing primarily that he's speaking of. He's speaking of mainly here, he's thinking about the persecution that one would endure as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason that you should not be surprised by that, my friends, is simply this. We know from the Word of God that there's a terrible war going on. We know that there's a war in which God and all of His forces are locked in deadly combat with Satan and all of His evil forces too. And so it would be an unusual thing, really, if we didn't have persecution. Because you understand that the world system is under the control of Satan. He's called the God of this world. And so here we are as the children of God, we're living in an alien environment, and we're actually living, as it were, behind enemy lines, so to speak, and the enemy is all around us. 
And what our situation is, is this, that we are, we are an upstream people in a downstream world. And it's not just in the sophisticated society that you and I live. It goes all the way through society. It goes all the way through every kind of civilization that you might find. I was reading the other night about a missionary who got into a very uh, secluded place back in the jungle. And he was able to reach a tribe that no one had ever been able to reach before. And these people were so cut off from the rest of the world, they'd never heard about Jesus. They were a cannibalistic tribe. And when he told them the gospel story, they lived in such a darkened mindset that when they heard the gospel story, Judas was the one that they thought was the hero. Can you imagine that? But my friends, listen, that's, going, that's not just something that happens back there in the woods somewhere. That's the way man thinks. We are an upstream people in a downstream world. Some of us were talking this morning about the disasters and the collapses that are going on in so many systems in our world, in our society, here in the United States. And I heard Barbara Walters quoted the other night as, as saying that the thing that seems to be missing among our school children today is that they're not learning character. No one has any character anymore. Well, we've gone through 30 years or more of of a secularized education where God is left out, where the, uh, the, uh, the teachings of the Word of God have been progressively eliminated from any sort of reference in the classroom. And so we're just reaping now. We're reaping the harvest of all those seeds that have been sown all down through the years. We are an upstream people in a downstream world. Don't think it a surprising thing when you and I, because we stand for something, because we stand for God and His way, that we are in a strange thing because we're being persecuted. No, you ought to understand that. We're going to be persecuted because we stand for God. Let me just give you some of the things that Christians can expect of what, uh, what kind of sufferings that a Christian might expect. First of all, persecution for righteousness, revilings and slander, false accusations, scourgings for Christ, rejection by men, hatred by the world, hatred by relatives, martyrdoms, temptations, shame for His name, imprisonments, tribulations, stonings, beatings, being a a spectacle to men, misunderstood, defamation and despisings, troubles, afflictions, distresses, tumults, labors, watchings, fastings, and evil reports. And so there's a listing there from the Word of God, and if you're interested, I'll be very happy to make you a copy of this, of references in the Word of God of different kinds of persecutions that Christians might expect as they go through this life. He says not to be surprised by this, stop being surprised by this, and it is a fiery ordeal that we go through. The terminology there for fiery ordeal is very, very aptly interpreted here in the New American Standard, and it is the the words that one would use for someone uh, that would be uh, using a smelter for the purification of silver. So we're going through these things for one purpose, for our purifying But keep in mind, we should not be surprised. Don't be surprised when down at the job. Don't be surprised when on the campus, student. Don't be surprised even in your own home. Don't be surprised there in the neighborhood that when you stand for God, you're going to find yourself being persecuted by those that are of the dark kingdom of Satan. So he says that we're not to be surprised. Don't let persecution surprise you. The next thing that he tells us here is to remember that all you see is not all you get. And let's see what he has to say about that. He says that if we are reviled, in verse 13 he says, But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing, so that also at the revelation of his glory you may rejoice with exaltation. If you're reviled for the name of Christ, you're blessed. Because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. 
Then on down in verse 16, he says, If anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not feel ashamed, but in that name glorify God. Things are not always the way they seem. And although it may seem sometimes that, that you're having to uh, be persecuted by, by people in this world, realize that, that all you see is not all that there is. And let's think now, we've, uh, I've given you a list of the sufferings and what they consist of. And now I want to give you another list. And this is a lot better list. This is 10 rewards for Christian suffering. So these are the rewards. These are the things that you don't see right then. But this is what the Lord promises us as we endure sufferings for Christ's sake. Greater glory in heaven. Eternal consolation. Eternal consolation. You see, the persecution that you might endure here on earth has a limitation. It only lasts for a a certain period of time. Not any teardrop that falls, not any drop of blood that falls, not any persecution or embarrassment that you suffer as a Christian goes unnoticed. And for that, that limited persecution you might endure, there will be eternal consolation. Then also, one of the rewards is making Jesus known. Bringing life to others. Making grace manifest. Guaranteeing of judgment, reigning with Christ, the Spirit upon us, we saw that right here, and the glory of God upon us, and also great joy. So although you may be persecuted for a season, remember you have eternal rewards waiting as you go through that. Then he says in verse 15 that we should uh, behave according to what we believe. He says, by no means let any of you suffer as a murderer or thief, or evildoer, or a troublesome meddler. So, one of the commandments that we're looking at tonight is that we should live according to what we say we believe. Every Christian needs to live according to what he says he believes. Then I want you to see something else here. Understand how critical God is of sin. I want you to look very carefully with me now at the next couple of verses. In verse 17 it says, For... It is time for judgment to begin with the household of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is with difficulty that the righteous is saved, what will become of the godless man and the sinner? Let's understand how critical God is of sin. God has judged sin. And God is not going to tolerate sin in His children. And so when we suffer, let's not suffer because of sin in our lives. Let's suffer for Christ's sake. Let's not suffer as as an evildoer, as one who is a troublesome meddler or a thief or a robber, or in any other way like that. Remember this, it is with great, great difficulty that we've been saved. We so often take our salvation for granted. That's, That's just... Sad, because our salvation is such a great thing. The, the language here uh, really refers back to that old situation back in Sodom and Gomorrah. You remember that story. You remember how Abraham had those three heavenly visitors. And as they came upon Abraham there, and he was gracious and set a meal out before them. He And he... he uh, uh, made them, uh, he was very hospitable toward them. And before they began to depart, to go on their way, the Lord said, Shall we hide from our servant Abraham that which we are about to do? They were on their way to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it. And you know that story so well. And he began to inquire what was going on. And they said, They're going down. The Lord said, I'm going down to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. And then Abraham began the bargaining process with the Lord. And he, he began to try to, to get the Lord to allow the city to, to stand if he could find just 50 righteous. And then he kept cutting it back and back and back. And finally he said, just 10. If you can just find 10 righteous, would you not destroy the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah? And the Lord said, that's right. If, you can, if we can find just 10. But when he got there, he couldn't even find 10 righteous people. The ones that were saved, Lot and his family, remember how they left the city? 
when the announcement was made to them that they were, the city was about to be destroyed, they didn't rejoice in the Lord. They didn't get up and, and go out willfully. As a matter of fact, it says that they had to be grabbed by the hand and literally drug out of that city. Now, folks, what I'm trying to say to you tonight is that salvation is like that. If God, if God hadn't reached down and gotten you and gotten me by the hand and drug us out of this destructive life that we were living in, we would still, we would still be there. Dear people, salvation is a wonderful gift. And then the last thing that we notice here in verse 19, he says, Therefore let those also suffer according to the will of God and trust their souls to a faithful Creator in doing what is right. And what we get from that is this. Don't hold anything back. Don't hold anything back. As we enter into times when there's persecution and tribulation ahead, great trials, testings, fiery ordeals, folk, don't draw back. The Bible says that the Lord has no patience with those that draw back. Don't hold anything back. Stand strong for the Lord. Stand strong in Him and commit your way unto the Lord. I wonder tonight what's holding you back. Are you where you should be? Are you serving the Lord as you should be serving Him? Are you fully committed to Him? Or is there something that's holding you back tonight? The Lord has visited us today in a very special way. And I just think we ought to conclude tonight with an invitation like this. If you want to come, if there's something holding you back that you just want to surrender tonight to the Lord, we want to make that time available to you. Would you stand please, bow your head. Let's just let the Lord deal with us, touch our hearts, speak to us. Let Him have His way in your life. If there's anything that's keeping you from being the Christian that you ought to be, Anything that's keeping you from doing what God wants you to do, I want you just to, tonight, let the Lord point that out to you. Don't let anything keep you from being all that God wants you to be. We're entering now into a a tremendous phase of the history of this church. But what's more important is your personal history. Are you really walking with God the way you ought to? Is there anything that you need surrender to the Lord tonight? Dana's going to begin to play. And I want you to feel just free to come, surrendering those things to the Lord tonight. Father, we just are grateful to you for the time that we've had together tonight. I thank you for the time that we've spent here on our knees together. I thank you for the meaningful way that you have met with us. And Father, it just seems in my heart that although we've been in our new home for six Sundays now, that really, somehow, today we've really come home. And Father, I just pray that you'll keep our hearts warm for God. And Lord, no matter what it might take, no matter what kind of persecution, no matter what kind of suffering, Lord, we just pray that you'll help us to stand strong, to stand fast, to be the people of God here, to reach out, to touch lives. Father, we know that all about us here, there are people that are hurting. There are homes that are shattered. There are those that are struggling with life. There are those that are losing the battle. And dear Father, we just pray that you let us be a lighthouse here in this dark, dark community. We'll be grateful to you for it. Lord, we've just brought a very brief message tonight. We've just outlined some of your commandments to us. But Father, I know that you speak to hearts. And I just ask you, Lord, now to give courage to those that know that there's something in their lives that's keeping them from being all they need to be for you. Would you lead them and guide them now, Father? We'll be grateful to you for it in Jesus' name. Head still bowed, eyes closed. If you want to just slip out from where you are right now, come, kneel here for a moment. Get something settled with the Lord. You come. You come now. This is your time.